Welcome to today's webinar, Elder Abuse, What Do We Know from Research and Practice? My name is Susan Howley, and I'm the Project Director for the Center for Victim Research. The research that is being reported on today, as well as the CVR and all of our webinars, are supported by funding from the Office for Victims of Crime at the Office of Justice Programs, U.S. Department of Justice. The center is built through a partnership between researchers and practitioners at the Justice Research and Statistics Association, the National Center for Victims of Crime, and the Urban Institute. The center's mission is to serve as a one-stop resource for victim service providers and researchers so they can connect and share knowledge to increase access to victim research and data and the utility of research and data collection to crime victim services nationwide. Today's webinar illustrates integrating research and practice, both from the topic of under discussion to the presenters themselves. It is now my pleasure to turn things over to today's speakers and let them introduce themselves. Thank you, Susan, and thank you everyone for joining. My name is Storm Irvin. I am a research analyst at the Urban Institute. I study intimate partner violence and gender-based violence, specifically looking at systems and programs designed for both victims and those who cause harm. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today. My name is Erica Henderson. I am a research analyst at Urban Institute in the Justice Policy Center, where my work focuses on victimization topics, such as gender-based violence, sexual assault, and elder abuse. Good morning. My name is Lynn Kastanik. I'm President and CEO of the Area Agency on Aging in Phoenix, Arizona. Thank you. So we have a quick poll. Um, as Susan mentioned earlier, the function raising your hand, we are asking you to use that. So to begin, raise your hand if you work for a service provider. Okay, great. Feel free to put your hand down. Have a few more of these. Raise your hand if you work for the Adult Protective Services. Okay, yes, you. Wanna move on? Please feel free to put your hand down. Raise your hand if you are a researcher. Okay, thanks. Moving on to the last one. Raise your hand if you are a student. Okay, great. So now we're going to jump into things. So, giving you an overview of what we will present today, we'll first start with the goals for CVR's evidence synthesis, which we also call our evidence review. From there, we'll speak at length around specific findings from our elder abuse review, including prevalence, risk factors, harms and consequences, services and prevention, and the recommendations. So, the goal of CVR's evidence synthesis are to assess the state of the field for different victimization topics. Unlike a traditional research literature review, we intentionally reviewed both research and practice evidence in order to reflect different and valuable sources of knowledge. So to date, CBR has completed uh, evidence that this is for both homicide co-victimization and fraud and identity theft. Um, materials for these reviews can be found on our website and in addition to elder abuse, we currently have a evidence synthesis underway for mass violence and terrorism. Moving on. So this diagram displays the model we use for our synthesis based on the CDC's framework for thinking about evidence. So this framework combines the best available research with practice evidence in the field. And we define practice evidence as publications put out by leading national elder abuse organizations, including the National Adult Protective Services Association, the National Center on Elder Abuse, and the Center of Excellence on Elder Abuse and Neglect. 
and we selected sources that reflected multiple perspectives or consensus among practitioners. We also selected sources that were repeatedly cited in the field and sources that were a key product from a government agency or organization. So we really compared and contrasted what research evidence said versus practice to create high-level summaries of our, victim, of our victimization topics. So commonly reviewed research evidence included peer-reviewed journal articles, reports, books, and book chapters, and commonly reviewed practice evidence sources included task force minutes, fact sheets, tip sheets, videos, and podcasts. Moving on. So CBR's evidence synthesis aim to advance our understanding of these topics by answering the following key questions. How often does victimization occur and how do we identify victims? What risk factors increase certain groups' vulnerability to victimization and its harmful impacts? What are the harms and consequences of victimization experiences? What intervention and prevention services are available to address victimization harms? And what are the implications of what we know for future practice, policy, and research evidence? If you are interested in getting more details about our methodology for these synthesis, feel free to visit our website. I will now pass it over to Storm, who will discuss findings from our elder abuse review. Thank you, Erica. So we're now going to move on to specific findings from the Elder Abuse Review. And we start by providing a definition. So based on CBR's review of definitions in the field, including the definition from the National Center on Elder Abuse, for the purpose of our review, we define elder abuse as any knowing, intentional, or negligent act that causes harm or serious risk of harm to an older adult. In particular, we focus on ages 60 or older, and this harm we are trying to a person of trust. Um, that can include a family member, a spouse, a caregiver, or a guardian. The field has not established a universal cutoff age for defining elder abuse victims. Some researchers and practitioners use 60 years, and others use 65 years. We use 60 years to be more inclusive, and because most state APS programs, adult protective services programs, use this cutoff. Um, there are different types of elder abuse, which you see here on the slide, and which we will also define in our final report, but for the sake of time, we are not going to define that now. Um, we recognize that some in the field are moving away from describing elder abuse in general and specifically focus on the types of elder abuse. Because we understand that elder abuse and the various types are complex, during this webinar, we discuss high-level findings and will interrogate the complexities more in our full report. So for the scope, uh, we focus on mistreatment or abuse committed by a person of class, as I mentioned, this is family, friends, caretakers. An example of, can also be an accountant. Uh, we do not include self-neglect or father scam. We exclude self-neglect because it is not a harm inflicted by an older adult, uh, by an older adult's person of trust. Um, and also we have a fraud and identity theft evidence synthesis, which does focus on uh, scams committed to um, older adults. And that webinar brief or report can be found on our website. Um, for our search results, we were looking at practice and research evidence produced in 2000 or later that fall within the previous mission scope and also wanted to be available in English. After reviewing hundreds of articles that may be on the a more conservative side, we included a total of 113 research sources and 348 practice sources. So now I'm going on to talk about prevalence. In particular, I am advancing the slide. Um, here we highlight two national studies that are included, um, that included either phone interviews or in-home interviews to older adults. The first is the National Elder Mistreatment Study, where researchers found an overall past year prevalence of 11%. And the National Social Life Health and Aging Project Schaefer and Kotai found a 23.5% past year prevalence of elder mistreatment. Now, there could be a few reasons for the differences in these two figures, while they are both self-report. In the National Elder Mistreatment Study, researchers conducted random digit dialing to U.S. households, whereas in the National Social Life Health and Aging Project, researchers oversampled by race, ethnicity, age, and gender. And there also are challenges with measurement. 
So for the National Elder Mistreatment Study, uh, which measured emotional, physical, sexual, sexual, financial mistreatment, and neglect, um, they used a series of questions for each subtype. Also, in prompting for the questions, researcher, researchers mentioned to the respondent that researchers were specifically interested if their mistreatment was from someone that they trusted, so a romantic partner, a spouse, a family member, a friend, or someone who helps to take care of the older adult. Whereas in the National Social Life Health and Aging Project, there were three questions that assessed for three different forms of mistreatment. The questions have to do with control, financial mistreatment, and physical violence. From the questions, it was not clear if researchers were interested if this had happened by an entrusted other. And something else I want to mention in talking about prevalence and the complexities, uh, we'll talk about in risk factors is, uh, we're just gonna talk about that in risk factors. Uh, but yeah, so just talking here about self-report, the way that, you know, studies are conducted, the way that older adults are sampled, how questions are framed can possibly account for the differences in uh, past year prevalence. And also the age, how you define age. So I know in the National Social Life Health and Aging Project, the age range was from 80, so it was from 57 to 85. Now, moving on to talk about elder abuse reported to or detected by professionals. Um, highlighted here are two studies that include those, so APS and also medical professionals in the emergency room. In the first study published by Jobers et al. in 2003, in fiscal year 1999 through 2000, researchers found a report rate of 8.6 per 1,000 older adults. In the second study, using emergency room department data, researchers found nearly a 6.7 million Sorry, researchers found that of nearly 6.7 million visits to the ER, 0.025% resulted in an elder abuse diagnosis. While elder abuse resulted in an ER visit is one of the more extreme cases, these two studies show that elder abuse typically doesn't make it to uh, the level of a medical professional. This being was found in further studies, such as the Medicare primary and consumer demonstration, consumer directed care demonstration where it took roughly 10 weeks for medical professionals to detect, to, to detect abuse to physically impaired older adults while visiting their homes. If folks are interested in elder abuse substantiated by APS, the best officially reported data available nationally are collected through the newly established Department of Health and Human Services National Adult, now, National Adult Maltreatment Reporting System. These data show substantiated cases, however, they are limited by how individual states define response and report such cases. So now, moving on to elder abuse reported by type. Well, looking at the previous mentioned self-report studies, emotional, psychological, verbal mistreatment, seen here as emotional, are among the most common forms, though financial exploitation was the most common form reported in the National Elder Mistreatment Study. Physical mistreatment was the less common form in both studies. Sexual mistreatment, sexual mistreatment was the least common form in the National Elder Mistreatment Study and was not assessed in the National Socialized Health and Aging Project. Just to reiterate, these studies had two different sampling and measurement approaches. Moving on to discuss risk factors. Um, I want to reiterate that certain risk factors increase vulnerability for specific forms of elder abuse. Here we briefly give high level findings to risk factors for elder abuse in general. So demographic risk factors, women are at increased risk of experiencing elder abuse. There's mixed evidence on which age groups among older adults are associated with increased risk, while older adults are typically defined as a person over the age of 60 by the Elder Justice Act. Some practice evidence concludes that older adults over the age of 80 are at greatest risk of victimization. However, some research sources point to older adults between the ages of 60 and 69. LGBT older adults typically report higher incidence of abuse than older adults whose sexuality and gender identities are not known um, or who are, who are not identified as um, LGBT. Um, there are several studies um, that show that people of color are at increased risk. The more risk factors, um, social, iso social isolation and loneliness, low socioeconomic status, dependency on other, um, physical health impairment, cognitive impairment, and 
uh, behavioral health issues. I want to draw particular attention to cognitive and physical impairment. So research shows that older adults with Alzheimer's disease, varying levels of dementia are desperately represented among victims of abuse. Additionally, several so sorry. Additionally, several studies have determined associations between definitive cognitive impairment, neurological and mental disorders, and scores less than 23 on the many mental state evaluations. Of the different forms of abuse, research shows that older adults with dementia are more likely to suffer from psychological abuse. Also pointing to physical abuse, um, declines in physical performance, needing assistance with activities of daily living, and this can include uh, needing assistance with brushing your teeth or having to use the restroom, and mobility impairment may increase risk. So, protective factor. Overwhelmingly, research and practice evidence show that social support and dense social networks may mitigate abuse or, um, mitigate abuse or chances for abuse. Now, with that, we do want to ask our um, practitioner who's also on the line, Mary Lynn, um, what additional protective factors have you come across in your work? Well, um, the biggest thing is that um, is when people are isolated, and um, this is a real concern right now with uh, the COVID-19, and seniors are isolated, no one is seeing them. Um, and so what we try to do is we've set up telephone reassurance calls, and um, when possible to do some in-home support, at least um, uh, like home delivered meals kinds of programs, just something so they're not totally isolated and no one has their eyes upon them. Okay, so that's the line with some of our research writing at isolation can increase risk, and it seems that service providers are in real time figuring out how to um, have that virtual social network and, as you said, in-person social network. So thank you for that. Um, now we're going to talk about some of the harms and consequences of elder abuse. And it overall falls into four overarching buckets, um, psychological, financial, physical, and societal. So older adults who experience abuse are likely to face multiple psychological harms, including depression, anxiety, distress, and loneliness. Physical consequences can include premature death, increased hospitalization, severe bruising, and increased risk of re-victimization. Financial consequences often include loss of assets, loss of dependence, and loneliness. And to highlight on the loss of dependence, sometimes the consequence may be fear of being placed into a nursing home or long-term care facility. Um, elder abuse also negatively impacts societal costs, such as having, such as causing increased um, health care expenditures. And with that, I am going to pass it to Erica. Okay. So I am going to go over some of our findings focused on elder abuse prevention, services, and interventions. So practice evidence emphasizes that training and education for those who work with older adults and programs that focus on educating elders are primary forms of prevention. These educational programs aim to help prevent elder abuse and often target older adults or service providers. They cover a wide range of topics, such as financial literacy, money management, resident rights, how to avoid potential abuse, how to recognize key indicators of abuse, and how to report. So training for a variety of professions is also seen as a promising prevention approach. Groups that typically receive training on identifying and addressing elder abuse include APS, victim services staff, health care professionals, court law enforcement, staff at financial institutions, and faith leaders. In addition, as previously mentioned, since social isolation is a major risk factor, supportive services that can assist with daily activities and increase in older adults' community engagement are helpful. Lastly, of course, raising awareness in the community can help bring attention to elder abuse and inform the public about ways they can prevent and address this problem. 
In terms of intervention, Adult Protective Services is the primary agency in charge of investigating and responding to allegations of abuse. Supports can also be made to long-term care ombudsmen, social workers, 911, and law enforcement. Law enforcement is also responsible for detecting elder abuse, enforcing court orders, apprehending suspects, conducting well-being checks, and engaging the community to promote public safety. So limited, some research evidence emphasizes the importance of law enforcement officers building relationships with systems in order to decrease risk factors and connect them to services. Prosecutors work to hold those who commit crimes accountable, and there's some research evidence documenting the unique challenges in elder abuse cases, such as impairment and the involvement of family members. Lastly, civil attorneys assist and provide help with legal services, such as protection orders, wills, guardianships, and power of attorney. So while the field generally lacks interventions that have a high level of evidence for reducing other abuse, there are several interventions that appear promising, including multidisciplinary interventions. So these efforts in particular have been noted to be one of the most successful approaches to elder abuse and neglect. MDTs are defined as a group of people from three or more disciplines found by a common purpose and characterized by shared decision-making and partnership. These teams typically come together to review cases of abuse, provide resources and advice, offer new perspectives, and engage in cross-training and cross-referrals. So this collaboration allows for centralized services and improvement and responses. Examples of these teams include financial abuse specialist teams, medical intervention teams, forensic centers, and elder fatality review teams. So MDTs have been found to reduce risk of future mistreatment and also improve responses to elder abuse at the prevention, detection, and investigation stages. In terms of advocacy and support, long-term care ombudsman, area agencies on aging, victim services, and system-based and safe-based advocates are important actors involved in providing support to older adults and victims of elder abuse. The functions of the state ombudsman programs are mandated by law and include identifying, investigating, and resolving resident complaints protecting the legal rights of residents, advocating for systemic change, and providing information to residents and their families. Area agencies on aging also offer a wide array of services, such as assessing community needs and developing and funding programs that respond to those needs, engaging in public awareness and public education, and providing direct services to victims and survivors. <clears throat> Victim service providers such as domestic violence programs, sexual, sexual assault programs, system-based services, and community-based services provide a variety of support such as financial assistance, safety planning, and mental health counseling. Victim advocates within the justice system can help elder abuse victims by, with navigating through certain processes by providing information and referrals and helping obtain support and aid. This can include some things such as victim compensation. Lastly, uh, safe communities can be a helpful avenue of support for victims since they often have frequent contact with older adults and are seen as trusted confidants. They often can create a safe space and connect older adults to resources. So in general, when it comes to elder abuse services and interventions, Rigorous evidence on what works is limited, and more research is sorely needed. MDTs are one of the most widely implemented responses, though there is limited evidence that they are effective in reducing elder abuse. One MDT model, uh, forensic centers, are thought to be most promising in terms of intervention and prevention of re-victimization. So with that, I will pass it to Mary Lynn who will describe specific programs ran by the Area Agency on Aging Region 1. All right, thank you, Erica. Uh, 
So as I talk about these, um, I'm going to just showcase like three things that we're doing to address elder abuse. Uh, in uh, 1993, we created the Maricopa Elder Abuse Prevention Alliance. And the first several years, we focused on, as Erica said, the importance of education and awareness about elder abuse. Um, but several years into it, we started wondering if domestic violence continued and was it just a, 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 a problem with young couples or did it extend over a lifetime? So we did some surveys of domestic violence shelters and we said periodically someone that was older came to the shelter but they just didn't feel comfortable being there with younger women and lots of children. And, you know, they were going through a healing process as a survivor. And so they often would just go back uh, to their abuser. And so what we started doing is um, in 1995, 1996, especially, we started doing uh, public awareness. We created a movie, did a lot of talks to help people understand that there was such a thing as late life domestic violence and, and domestic violence continued through the years and often didn't get better and sometimes got worse. And so we decided that the best way to support um, the victims of domestic violence was to have support groups. And so we started, uh, Maricopa County is very large, but sort of an east side, west side, central, uh, three support groups where we invited um, older women who were victims to come to the support groups and to really understand it's not their fault, um, they're not in this alone, um, there are other people in the same situation. We never su suggested to them that they should leave their abuser, but they start asking us, what do we do if we have to leave? And so by 1996, we created an emergency housing program using empty beds and assisted living facilities. And so they were able to stay there for free for two weeks. So what we found out after a while uh, was that 50% of those in emergency housing had nowhere to go except back to the abuser. And so through the generosity of the city of Phoenix and some funding from the state housing department, we were able to buy a 19 unit apartment complex, which um, we call transitional housing. And so now the program has been thriving since 2003, um, the transitional housing. We continue with support groups, emergency housing, and most recently, mobile advocacy, where we go out to see the victim where they are instead of just having them come into a group and work with them one-on-one. -on -one. And of course, it's very important that we also continue the public awareness. The um, next um, program I want to talk about is the APS care coordination. So. Uh, the Department of Economic Security, which is our state unit on aging, um, or the state unit on aging, runs the Adult Protective Service Program. And so what they did was they came and asked me if we could provide training to their staff on how to find, on information referral and how to find resources in the community. Because they said about 60% of APS staff time was spent trying to find, you know, connect um, the people that they're seeing with resources in the community. So in 2006, I suggested to them that why didn't they, you know, they do the investigation, that's Adult Protective Services. We as an area agency are the service people, so just refer those clients to us and we'll take care of the service piece. They still remain an APS client, but uh, we would, you know, make sure we were linked up with the services. And so we started in 2006, it was a little slow at first, but it's really grown a lot. And so basically the adult protective services refers a client, tells us what the situation is. We have two case managers that work full time at our own expense, and they go in and see what the client needs. And our worst case scenario, is this older adult has been um, 
um, it, 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 these cases are almost all self-neglect. And so the older adult gets overwhelmed. Uh, there's stuff that's piled up over the years. They're not able to take care of their house and all of that. And so we go in and do all the cleaning, all the repairs that are needed so they can continue to live there if it's in their best interest. And then what we do is we put in home and community-based services. We get them Meals on Wheels and we get them ongoing home care or personal care to help with bathing, uh, may, maybe put in grab bars, those types of things, and um, maybe give them attendant care. And so almost from the very first, the recidivism for this, um, people that were you know, clients that refer to us for for self neglect the recidivism dropped from 27% down to 3%. And finally my last slide I wanted to talk about um the other thing that we've been doing since um 2014 um is that we've been doing our own world elder abuse awareness campaign and um, most years, well, we do print media, email, e-blast, press releases. Um, we do advertisements at local Harkins theaters. will give us um, the slides for free that, that you see before you um, watch the movie. Unfortunately, with COVID-19, uh, uh, most of that got nixed this year. And we still send out the e-blast and print media. And I just showed you four themes. Um, four years ago, we said stay connected, um, be protected, and this really comes, this is actually a picture of some people in my neighborhood. I live in a small neighborhood where people look after each other. The following year, year when it was the Me Too, we did a campaign about We Too um, could be victims of sexual assault. Last year, we partnered with the local SEAL, which was um, uh, called Ability 360, to really show that abuse hurts us all and can be not only people 60 and over, but very much so in the 18 plus population if they have a physical disability. And then the one this year is the caution about social distancing um, that can mask, you know, that the mask can mask the fact that you are um, being abused and no one is around to check up on you. So with that, I will send it back to Erica. Thank you, Mary Lynn. Lots of great stuff happening. Really appreciate all the hard work. So with that being said, um, all these great services and programs are being developed. However, there are some barriers to accessing services. So not all elder abuse victims um, seek help, and some common barriers are physical and cognitive limitations, shame and embarrassment, fear of retaliation, dependence on abuser, self-blame, lack of awareness, and cultural norms or responses. In addition to the general barriers um, to service previously mentioned, not all traditional services are set up to address the unique needs of diverse groups of older adults. So some barriers among vulnerable groups include family abandonment, geographic isolation, language barriers, cultural emphasis on the family, lack of awareness of services, and distrust of institutions. Some interesting and effective approaches to addressing these barriers have been partnering with other organizations who focus on serving these groups and already have a close connection with that population, and also restorative justice approaches, which involve bringing together the community, victim, family, and wrongdoer, and treating abuse as a violation of a relationship rather than a crime. However, overall, there is a need for culturally appropriate training and resources um, and engaging these groups and educating providers in the community is key. The major legislation in place to address elder abuse are the Elder Justice Act and the Older Americans Act, which includes the Older Americans Reauthorization Act and the Supporting Older Americans Act of 2020. 
There are also mandatory reporting statutes that require certain professionals to report certain cases of abuse and neglect. So all states have these mandatory reporting requirements. However, they vary in several ways, including who is required to report, which act actions constitute abuse and require reporting, and what exactly must be reported. So some professionals argue whether mandatory reporting is beneficial or harmful to victims of elder abuse. On one hand, mandatory reporting may lead to an increase in the number of cases that reach APS and law enforcement, and in turn, increase victim safety. However, there are also concerns that mandatory reporting may undermine a victim's autonomy or lead some victims not to seek help from a service provider or other agency because they know that a report will be made regardless of their wishes. Lastly, we have power of attorney and guardianship laws. So power of attorney is a legal document that gives someone authority to act for the person who made the document, while guardianship is a relationship created by state law in which a court gives one person the duty and power to make decisions for another. So it's important to note that while a power of attorney allows you to choose who you want to act on your behalf, guardianship is court appointed, which means the court chooses who will act on your behalf. So while planning for incapacity may avoid the appointment of a guardian, power of attorney can also be misused and lead to further exploitation. Okay, so through our review, we were able to identify a number of recommendations to improve the field of elder abuse. The first one is improve prevention and mitigate consequences of elder abuse by identifying and evaluating effective interventions and programs. So this includes promoting and developing intervention efforts that foster positive social support, building and expanding partnerships in the field, and increasing research and program evaluations to determine other effective interventions for addressing elder abuse. The second one is to increase culturally relevant training and resources for diverse racial and ethnic populations. So elder abuse research is needed in this topic area in order to identify the incidence, prevalence, risk protective factors, and all those things for diverse groups. There's also a need for culturally appropriate training and resources for those who work with older adults in order to effectively prevent abuse and provide services to victims. The third one is to increase attention to the needs of older adults who are cognitively impaired. So cognitive impairments make older adults especially vulnerable, which means they require extra layers of protection. So the field should enhance focus on cognitive incapacity, which includes research and developing prevention, intervention, and surveillance methods designed to protect cognitively impaired older adults. Oversight and policies around powers of attorney and guardianship also need to be improved in order to prevent abuse, and there needs to be more data collection efforts in these areas. Thank you, Erica. Um, so some other areas where the field can grow is to improve national prevalence estimates and continue working to find consistent definition of elder abuse types and their measurement. Given how research supply different measurements, self-report research, and how states have state-specific uh, protocols for reporting, investigating, and substantiating cases, it is understandable how estimates may largely vary. The bill can work to improve definitions and reporting structures to improve national estimates. With that, I want to say there are a number of elder abuse screening and assessment tools that are out in the field. Um, most are used by practitioners, and we have these uh, tools on our website at victimresearch.org. Um, so, yeah, we want to point you to those. However, we know there are some that are uh, used more often than others, so the vulnerability to abuse screen, the conflict tactic scale. There are, um, again, there are many. And so we would employ the field to find consistent measures and um, definitions so that it is easier to understand how large or how maybe unlarge, even though we know that most abuse cases are not reported, um, so the field can understand how prevalent things actually are. Um, moving on. So, and adopt the intersectional lens. Um, so, intersectionality coined by uh, Kimberly Crenshaw acknowledges that 
an individual, particularly women of color, may have multiple intersecting identities. This can also be seen in the field of elder abuse. So a person can be both a woman and cognitively impaired with, and we know that being a woman makes you more susceptible to elder abuse and so does being cognitively impaired, or add those two and then add an additional uh, element of race or low socioeconomic status. And so by adopting an intersectional lens, practitioners and researchers will understand who is mo more vulnerable or most vulnerable to elder abuse and develop specific interventions to address that. Um, the last recommendation that we have is acknowledge and address polymicization. So we know that elder abuse doesn't happen in silos. As we mentioned, uh, there are multiple forms and people can experience those forms at the same time or they may experience this with one, at one point in life and maybe experience emotional abuse at another point in life. And so acknowledging that um, there are different forms of abuse that can happen at various points in an older adult's life, uh, service interventions can uh, better address and tailor their approach towards those. And with that, we have some of our selected references. Again, we have a, over 113 research articles that we use, and well, 113 that we use, but we screened over 113. And we have 348 practice refer references, so you won't see them all here. Um, and with that, we are, again, grateful for everyone who tuned in today. And I am going to pass uh, the panel back to Susan. Great, thank you. So folks, this is a great time to um, enter your questions in the chat box. So far, we've had a lot of activity in the chat box, but most of it has related to um, sharing good programs or raising other issues that should be addressed, which is all good. So I encourage you to look at that, but please do um, enter your questions. I'm gonna start out with one for the researchers. Um, you mentioned that you sifted through a great deal of evidence as you were working on this synthesis. Where did you see the most research overall and, um, and recently in case that changed? Did you see more research on physical abuse, sexual abuse, financial abuse, neglect, and, and has that changed over time? Um, no, I'll take that one. So, Many articles did not break it out by subtypes, but some did. Uh, to give you an exact number would be difficult right now to give you an exact number of uh, which articles broke down subtypes. Um, I can say most of the research we saw was state-based or community-based research. And again, a lot of times just assessing for any form of abuse, but then again, there are instances and there are state-level studies that have uh, abuse broken down by type. And if that's changed over time, I have to not analyze that section. All right, here's another question. Given what's happening with COVID, do you see a greater role in the future for virtual or online programs? One participant mentioned cyberseniors.org as a program that helps prepare older adults to connect online. So do you see more service provision happening online or in the future? I can start with this one and then pass it off to Mary Lynn um, for another project that I'm a part of. We are doing um, some part of it over the phone. So I definitely see an opportunity for, for more of that. And I know there are telephone programs where seniors can call in to connect with others um, that are becoming a big deal, especially with COVID. Uh, there are challenges, of course, with technology and with people's comfortable level of comfort with using that technology. So that will, of course, be a challenge as these expand. But um, Mary Lynn, I'll let you hop in if you guys are are starting to explore that. Yes. Yeah, so in um, our DOVS program since mid March, um, they have been doing the one on one with the clients. Um, you know, by phone. Uh, at first they tried to do it in person and then almost immediately someone's, you know, knew someone in their family that was uh, COVID positive. So we did go to the phone, um, you know, the phone counseling and sessions through there. The 
biggest problem for older adults is many of, especially the people we serve, they don't have the technology, they don't have the computers, or if they do have the computers, they just, you know, are able to do emails, um, so they can't do um, Zoom meetings or, you know, other more sophisticated, it, and, and the problem is we could buy some older adults some laptops and iPads, but who's going to go and train them? So that's a real problem. I'll say one more thing with the APS Care Coordination Program. Uh, they continue to see clients, but they have always practiced um, safety and safe practices um, because the clients that they see often have homes that are, you know, they might have a lot of bugs or a lot of dirt or animal feces and so forth. So they always, um, wear covering on their shoes, they wear gowns, of course they always wear gloves, they've been wearing face masks for a while. So uh, we try to continue to see those clients, but COVID has sure put a, a damper on the way we do services, service delivery to older adults. Thank you. I do want to let everyone know that you will be receiving a copy of the slides when we send out the recording to this webinar. Um, Mary Lynn, another question has come in for you. How full is your apartment complex of victims typically? Um, well, it is a 19-unit complex, and three of them, uh, one of them is used as a computer lab, one is used as an office, and the other one is, um, well, two of them are used as offices and meeting rooms, and one is used. So we actually have 16, and they are constantly full. With a waiting list, uh, we typically have had four to eight people at any wait, any one time waiting to get into uh, the facility. And as I said, uh, they can stay there up to two years. We encourage them to move on as quickly as they become quote, independent and, and can manage. We try to help them find an apartment, uh, apply for HUD housing and all of that so they can move on um, as quickly as possible, but they can stay up to two years. So there's constantly a waiting list. Mm. It sounds like a great program. It is. Another question, and this is for the researchers. In terms of sexual abuse, you mentioned that cognitive impairment increases the risk of abuse. Can you discuss any assessment tools that are used to ascertain consent with regard to sexual abuse or other sexual behavior? Or have you come across any of those assessment tools yet? Sorry, um, I wanted to make sure I wasn't muted. Uh, so, I'm sorry, Susan, can you repeat the question? Yes. In terms of sexual abuse, you mentioned that cognitive impairment increases the risk of abuse. Have you seen any assessment tools that can be used to, to ascertain consent with regard to whether this was sexual abuse or other sexual behavior? So I can not definitively answer that, but I can say we are putting together uh, a research data. Uh, we're putting together a tools collection of sexual assault tools. Um, however, if they are catered toward older adults with cognitive impairment, it's questionable, and I would say I, I would doubt it. I do know there have been studies, um, and we have one in our review of older adults who've been victims of sexual assault or sexual violence, who cases were reported to APS. Yes. Of, um, of those cases, I think majority or most or maybe all had cognitive impairment. Um, I would, if whoever asked that question could personally message me, I would be happy to point you to that article. But as far as assessing, so that's a measurement challenge too, assessing um, victimization among people who are cognitively impaired. And that's a major limitation in a lot of studies because they do have that, um, that hard, that challenge and being able to ask or find the, the credible or reliable assessment tool that will ask someone with cognitive or cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's uh, questions and get the, uh, Give valid answers, but yes. Yeah. Thank you. So just just to reiterate, the person who um, asked that question can put their their email in the chat box, and you can respond to them directly 
Also, folks, I want to let you know that when the synthesis is produced, it will include a bibliography with all of the evidence that was examined by the team. The next question, aside from the multidisciplinary teams that are in use uh, around the country, are there other identified ideas on ways to combat elder abuse and to focus on prevention or to provide services? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, in terms of services outside of MDT, there was limited evidence, so there was some, um, that typical victim services such as counseling or support groups uh, were effective for victims. Um, and then in terms of prevention, the main areas are educating older adults, educating those who work with older adults, training for those professionals, um, and then increasing social engagement, and then overall just raising, raising awareness in the community and among providers about what to look for, how to help, and things like that. And so this is Mary Lynn. Um, so I really, you know, from local practice, this isn't from research, is I think there's a direct correlation to lack of home and community-based services and the reports of self-neglect. And I know you're talking about elder abuse um, primarily and not self-neglect. But we, several years ago, we lost millions of dollars in state funding to home and community-based services. And while we only had about, the lowest was about 130, 113 people who were on the waiting list, over the next seven, eight years, the waiting list went up to 1331, so 1,331. And people were waiting up to a year to get on, um, you know, home care, bathing, attendant care, adult day health care, and so forth. At the same period that um, in our county where we had this long waiting list and a loss of funds, the number of self annual self-reports went from 872 to a high of 2,804 in a year in just our county. And so I believe that there is this, you know, it's not a research, but through practice that you can see that if you can't go in and help older adults to maintain their living in their own homes, that someone's going to come along and say, oh, my neighbor is, you know, really in bad shape and we'll report them to APS. So I think it's really important that we have adequate home and community-based services, especially for the most frail older adults. Well, thank you, Mary. I'm gonna ask Jason to go ahead and post our exit poll right now, but please do continue to ask your questions in the chat box. Another question that's come in, is there research being initiated on how to screen for elder abuse in a, quote, new normal of remote service provision? So, in other words, which type of red flags you could focus on over the phone, or what to keep in mind about victims who may be sheltering in place with potential abusers? I'm not sure who wants to tackle that question. I would... Oh. <laughs> I was going to refer to to Mary Lynn because I know this, of course, didn't really come up in research that we looked at, but maybe there are new developments um, in the field. But go ahead, Star. Oh, um, sorry. Just on domestic violence in general. So I would, also this is not answering the question about assessment, but I myself and Sarah Psalmsky wrote a blog not too long ago about um, individuals experiencing domestic violence. Uh, during a pandemic, it did not particularly talk about elder abuse, but it did talk about older adults who may be experienced domestic, who may experience domestic violence and knowing what rights they have uh, during a pandemic. And there are courts that are operating virtually, so orders of petitions are available in certain courts, um, calling the 
calling victim service providers who, as Mary Lynn mentioned, there are a number who are um, providing tele or telework or remote services. But I do think um, Mary Lynn can talk specifically about elder abuse. Mary Lynn, do you have anything to add about those who may be sheltering in place with potential abusers or um, providing this type of service remotely? Okay, um, Mary Lynn, I believe you're still muted. All right, well, we'll get back to Mary Lynn in, in just a moment. Um, another question or a comment that has come in. Um, men oh, this is a comment about changes that might be needed. With mental health and financial counseling for older adults, um, a few states, only a few states allow that under VOCA compensation. Only a few state VOCA, state victim compensation programs allow mental health and financial counseling for older adults. And so the, um, the poster is saying that changes in state VOCA laws could help many elder financial exploitation victims. She also notes that many can't afford co-pays if they have insurance and many counselors aren't trained on financial exploitation or other issues related to um, adult abuse. And Mary Lynn, if you're still there and you're able to unmute yourself, um, I can re-ask the question. And meanwhile, let me see what other questions have come in. Someone wants to know, are there any statistics on institutional elder abuse? And if so, are those statistics going up or down? Yeah, so uh, my apologies. That was something I forgot to mention when framing the discussion. So majority of what we all of what we discussed today are um, prevalent and community-based uh, community settings. So people who are at home, living in their own, um, living with a caregiver or living in their own home. We do have some information on older adults in long-term care facilities. However, we understand that this does not represent the majority of older adults, but they are still equally important. And so I would say, um, again, we are refining our final report now, and that information will be there. But yes, there is, uh, there is um, elder abuse happening within long-term care facilities and nursing homes. Great, thank you. Um, I note that Mary Lynn is saying that her screen has frozen and she's unable to unmute herself. So if anyone has any additional questions for Mary Lynn, go ahead and put those in the chat box. If she's not able to answer them through chat, we will make sure that she gets those questions and can respond to you later. Remember- All right, I just, this is Mary Lynn. Very good. Do you want to re-answer the question? Well, the when you had the um, when you did the polling, it uh, blocked out my access to my. Um, okay, but I'm on. So, what was the question? Okay, great. We had really two questions. The first is, um, have you seen any, or or what should we keep in mind about victims who may be sheltering in place with potential abusers? Well, we try to do a, uh, we, we are doing um, telephone reassurance. Um, almost over 1,500 people we call every week. And so it's a, it's not just are you okay, but we're using therapists who are talking about how they're feeling, do you see family members, and really trying to get them to open up without coming out and saying, are you being abused? But try to look for red flags Flags as we talk to them. You know, uh, we have a lot, we've been, the feedback we get is there's a lot of anxiety about COVID, um, concerns that they're not seeing family members, but that's about what we can do. The other one is when we're doing Meals on Wheels um, from senior centers or we're doing, we take out food boxes to, seniors that call us is, I think just look for those red flags. Like if you take a meal every day, 
and Mrs. Rodriguez is never answers the door, um, that would, you know, make have a red flag is that she's supposed to be getting the meal and yet this young son or some grandson is there answering the door. So this is those kinds of things you need to look for. It is more difficult when you can't see them in person. All right, I wanna remind everyone that we will be sending out the slides uh, when we send out the recording link in a couple of days. If anyone needs a certificate of participation, please email us at ask at victimresearch.org and we'd be happy to send that to you. And now I really want to thank our presenters. This has been so interesting and I know that it was so much work to try to synthesize all of the evidence in such a, a broad topic. So Storm and Erica, thank you so much for your work. Mary Lynn, thank you so much for lending the practitioner voice to today's presentation. Thank you, Susan, and thank you again, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. So folks, this, the Center for Victim Research is compiling written documents related to this evidence synthesis, and we will be certain to send you an email when those are available. We anticipate releasing those in the next couple of months. So thanks again for your attention today. Please do take the poll before you sign off. And thanks again to our presenters. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>